welcome to the couch room. <laughs> it's the chat room, but with a velvet couch. It's so cool that I'm sitting here with Stacy London. Do you remember when we met? I do remember ago? we met. I just remember that it was on uh, a street corner. It was a very fateful Sunday. It was. I was going through a strange transition. I wasn't sure if the audience, the fans, wanted to read my content anymore and I was still so married to the written word and you gave me some of the best advice I've ever received. I replay your saying it to me in my head like almost every day, which is let them rise to your level. Don't dumb yourself down. Are you just very good at doling advice or is this something you learn from experience? A little bit of both. I'm great at doling advice. I'm just not very good at taking it. <laughs> you know, I'm one of those people. I will tell you why. You know, it was very funny. So I did 10 years of a show called What Not to Wear on TLC. Just a little show. Just it's a like little that show. little school just outside of Boston. Exactly. <laughs> um, have you heard of it? Anyway, um, yeah. No, so I did that show. And I, I learned... I watched that on Saturday mornings. Did was, you? Yeah, with a bowl of cereal, Cinnamon Toast Crunch, Cancer Cereal. Okay, that... Well, I actually am thrilled that it was Cinnamon Toast Crunch because I love that cereal. But the reason that, you know, part of that show really was for me about... It, it wasn't... It had nothing to do with fashion. It had everything to do with psychology, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't... It wasn't it wasn't what you were wearing, it was why you were wearing it. And when I um, left the show, I kind of woke up and saw that the world around me had completely changed and that even reality television wasn't how-to based anymore and that the internet had sort of taken over, the interwebs had mm -hmm. sort of taken over that role. Um, and you know, people started to ask me about bloggers and I was like, bloggers, what is, what is blogging? I don't even understand, like this is not my generation. And then I started to, you know, sort of look at what that world meant. And I looked around and saw a lot of people who really had no kind of understanding or insight into fashion saying, I have a lot of money, look at my new shoes every day. And having, you know, pictures taken of them. And when I found your blog, um, I was totally taken with it because it was so intelligent. And it was the first blog that I found that actually um, moved the needle in terms of what fashion is doing in the world. And it well, was... I could say the same thing about what not to wear. Well, I think, you know, thank you. I think that, but I do think reality TV was sort of a precursor in mm -hmm. terms of fashion to what happened um, in terms of blogging, which was um, we went from a how-to culture in reality television to a me-too culture yeah. in, in blogging. And the reason that I think you kind of created such an amazing following was that you finally took something that felt stuffy and um, inapproachable, unapproachable, um, and sort of uh, opaque and, and broke it open into something fun and joyful and, and that we're allowed to laugh at ourselves. And nobody in fashion- We have to laugh. But nobody in fashion was doing that. Not not in a way that well, was... Well, you were. Yeah, but, you know, even, I will be honest, I think I took myself too seriously in the meeting because I was worried, since I'd never been on television and I didn't know what the hell I was doing, that I was supposed to be an expert. And that if I if I was, like, self-deprecating or, you know, too jokey, that I wouldn't be taken seriously. It took me a good five or six years to kind of chill out. Well, speaking of self-deprecation and joyousness and funniness, <laughs> yes. you were telling me about your guide to single girl dressing. Yes, my... I think humanity deserves to know more about, which you can know about if you buy Stacy's book. Yes, oh right, The Truth About Style, that's right. I do write, um, I wrote a chapter, basically um, the book is nine, actually ten case studies, nine women and me, mm -hmm. um, about the obstacles that hold us back from dressing in the best and most authentic way possible. And they're all different reasons. There's like fear of judgment, there is fear of failure, um, there's, you know, the idea, I did one young woman who was 19 who was suffering from eating disorders and having mm. trouble seeing herself correctly. Right. You know, couldn't, her brain wasn't catching up. I feel like that's kind of at the crux of it, is not really knowing, and fear it totally perpetuates this, or maybe is informed by just not being honest with yourself, not knowing yourself. I completely agree. At the, at the end of that book, what I really discovered is that self-awareness is the key to great style. And that if you try and do it the other way around, and you know, similar to saying, you know, don't don't let your your fans dictate your content, mm -hmm. um, it's sort of like allowing trends and an industry, which is fashion, to dictate who you are. 
or who you think you need to be. Instead of understanding who you are and then picking and choosing trends based on your individual taste. So you're filming right now. I am, I'm filming season two. The idea behind it is it's, it's you know, it's still a transformation so, show, excuse me, uh, it's transformative, right? Mm -hmm. I hate the word makeover, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of make under, I'm just sick of it. Uh, I mean, really, I'm just, I can't, I can't take any more of it. I'd much rather call it like evolution. Yeah. But the idea of it, the title, Love, Luster, Run, um, I'll be honest, it's not my favorite title in the world. You should have called it Darwin, period. Oh my God, that's so good. But that's like very heady. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, that would have to be on like <laughs> all of that two would, people. Right, would watch all of two people show. would have to watch that on Nat Geo. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know that that would go over. Or on but, like a password <laughs> protected <on the> TV <laughs> exactly channel. Um, but the the title refers to the way somebody might react. The the first thing that they would think if mm -hmm. they saw you on the street, and. You know, I am not one of those people who's like, oh God, well, public opinion means everything. Mm. What I'm more concerned with is that when people dress in a way that's very extreme, um, that A, they know why they're doing it and that they're self-aware and that the message that they want to convey to other people is actually the message that's being conveyed. Yeah. It's the difference between translation, transmission and translation. So what you think you're putting out, what you think you're doing by wearing a long sweater because you hate your ass, actually makes people think, wow, she hates her ass because she's wearing that long sweater and she's right. trying to hide it, right? So that that applies very much, I think, to women who um, are, you know, doing all sorts of extreme styles, whether, you know, whatever that is, and then say that there's a disconnect in their life, like they're not getting what they want mm -hmm. and they're not getting the reaction that they want from people. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Exactly. And in a lot of ways, I've, I've worked with a lot of women who, um, you know, display signs of defensive dressing. It's like they were bullied, so they went so far in the opposite direction, so you can't hurt me. I'm mm -hmm. gonna hide behind this costume or this mask. And they don't really wanna be seen. Okay, so I've never seen an episode of Sex in the City. No way! And you call yourself a woman? Well, here's my thing about that, okay? I went through this period where I was like, is this really women or is this gay men writing for women? And I got very fatits and fachatted about the idea that it was like a caricature of yeah. what four women would be like. Well, so, uh, Sex and the City was an important show for me because I feel like those women became my friends. Yes. Even though they obviously had no idea who I was. And I, I often reference the television show when I'm talking about Man Repeller and the future of Man Repeller. Because what I'm trying to do with the site and on the internet is build that same sort of sense of community and treehouse and all girls club. And Sex and the City was totally my escape from the banalities and like harsh realities of my life, e.g. men breaking up with me and uh, my friends being assholes. Right, and did you feel like when you were watching Sex and the City that um, you could relate? Like they, like when you say that you felt like they were your friends, it's like, didn't they have guys break up with them? One broke up with one on a post-it or something? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I know a little bit about it. I was very young, <laughs> I was still super young, so I, I think that there was also an aspirational quality there, right? right? Where I was like, wow, so this is what my life is gonna be like, and I, it changed the narrative in that it became aspirational to be a single woman in New York, well, which is, was revolutionary then. And is revolutionary now. And I got thinking about women who are comfortable being single, but are uncomfortable with the fact that they're defying such a salient convention. Well, I, I think I get uncomfortable with the fact that um, there's this sense that the perception of me is always sort of couched in that definition. Right. Um, you know, well, why is she single? Like, yeah. you know, what's wrong with her? As opposed to it either being a choice or not even a choice, just not making, um, not finding that there was, you know, the person that I wanted to stay with permanently or that I've been in long-term relationships my whole life. It's just that they all had a lifespan to them. They all had an expiration date. And I don't really see that as a reflection of my, um, desirability or my uh, ability in life or my capabilities. Um, but I do think that there's still a perception in society. There's a book that just came out, um, I'm spacing on the name of the author called Spinster. Mm -hmm. And it's brilliant because it's about her life choice to be single. But she chose a word that is, you know, really got a, a sort of pejorative definition. Um, the spinster, to bachelor. right? Exactly. Bachelor's like you know a hipster with like a, a bar that with you know an electronic, couch. Uh, right? An electronic couch. bar that you know comes up when and you push a button. And on his wall. Exactly, and like you know bond. 
Uh, James Bond, you know, but there's no Jane Bond. Our society now, this is going full circle, is that now being a single woman is so far ahead of where we are sociobiologically mm -hmm. that it kind of doesn't make sense. Yeah. So the way that women, and, and one of the reasons that What Not To Wear and Love Lester Run as a show become important is because women are emotionally invested in their appearance in a way that men just aren't. And I mean, I have said this before that, you know, I feel like a guy can be a troll, but if he has a G5, it's like, you know, he'll get like a super hot girl. There's definitely an element of process of, of elimination across both sexes. Yes. I think that Man Repeller is a, when I launched Man Repeller, I think that it was sort of an epiphany for me because I was still single at the time and I was like, oh my gosh, this is giving me so much control. I'm single because I like fashion and I'm not going to choose a man over fashion and so I win. And then I got back together with my boyfriend who's now my husband and I was like, or man repelling is a process of elimination because it allows the good ones to, to rise to, to the surface. Yeah. Absolutely. People think of fashion tape like one out of 33 women even know about fashion tape. What would one do with accessory tape dots? Well, I find the dots most helpful for mm -hmm. is actually keeping necklaces from going awry. Oh. That's my favorite thing to use a dot for. So anything that's some a pendant or a statement necklace that where you can kind of put a row of dots can be very helpful so it doesn't move all day, especially when you're on camera. But that's just the fashion tape. There are like so many things that you could be using that are quick fixes that are not just for television or red carpets, they're for real life everyday shortcuts for people who are busy. And I'm just concerned by the rocking. How are you feeling? Just saying. It's good. Accessory tape dots. But my favorite thing is this. Deodorant removing sponge. Yes. Now, the oh. great thing about this sponge is Please. that you can cut it up into little strips so you can make it, put it in a travel. So what I do is I take the sponge, that I seems cut like it. That very strategic and Jewish. Like only, a, very Jew <laughs> only a Jewish woman would be like, I'm gonna cut this up and multiply it. Yes, and put it in every bag I own. Yeah. <laughs> what are these for, fashion tape shaped? This is what you do with different necklines so that they stay in place. And what I love about this stuff, there's also, there are so many great things in here. Um, in the, this is the uh, Style Essentials like deluxe kit, which of course with, you would have with to have. a PVC bag that you can use to tote around tampons after the fact. That's a whole lot of tampons. Yeah. I'm just gonna say so. Probably for super, super plus. Uh -huh. Regular and junior. That would be me. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And like a maxi pad just to throw people off. Like what? And these are the secrets. These are the things you should have in your office, in your home, in your bag. Just so that you always like look and feel your best. Because to me, part of, of looking good is that that actually will make you feel good. Yeah. And part of feeling good is that you know that you look, that you look good. good. So confidence and certainty, certitude is very important to style. Certitude. I like that word more than certainty. That's a really good one. So if you're prepared, mm -hmm. which is my big thing, that allows you to feel certain that you know what you're doing, that yeah. you know what you're putting together, looks the right way, feels the right way. It's like having a good hair day. You just you just feel better. Mm -hmm. Constant wind being blown into your hair. And you still feel good about it. Yeah. Speaking of good hair days, good, I don't want to say anything. Good, good hair days. My name's Leandra, and I <laughs> went to fitness class this morning.